Good morning. It's time for Daily Chapel at the LCMS International Center in St. Louis. Chaplain Sean Denzer is preaching a series of sermons through the Catechism for the first three weeks of Advent. Today, we continue with the Sacrament of the Altar. The broadcast of Chapel is underwritten by LCMS International Mission and Ministry to the Armed Forces. A reading from 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper, For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the Lord's Supper, the bread is the true body of Christ, the wine, the blood of Christ, by virtue of his Christ's powerful word. It is given to us to deliver the forgiveness, life, and salvation that he won on the cross. And it is of great benefit to us because it is a means of certainty and comfort to our consciences. Everyone who communes at the Lord's Supper then must know those words of institution. I don't lay this on you as some kind of memory assignment, which I've been known to do, but I lay it on you simply as a necessity. Every Christian needs to know what Christ is giving in his supper. The Lord's Supper has been called sometimes the medicine of immortality, and that's a useful analogy. Medicine and this supper are healing gifts. But also, medicine is not a no-harm, no-foul affair. It can be misused, and it can be misused to our great harm. So it is also possible to eat and to drink the Lord's Supper to your harm, spiritually, eternally. Christ wants us to have this gift. He wants everyone, in fact, to have it. But he wants us to have it for our benefit not for our harm. Now, the Corinthian Christians in today's text, they were abusing the Lord's Supper, so much so that Paul even says, you're not even coming to eat the Lord's Supper, but something totally different, at least in your minds. So Paul wrote to correct and to bring them back. He repeated for them the words of Christ's testament, of course, where all of the answers are found. No testament can be altered after it's been put into effect, as we said yesterday. Therefore, we ought not change the elements of bread and wine or wander far at all from the Lord's institution. 
The Lord gives his true body and blood in this supper. It is not ordinary food and drink to be treated as such or to be mistreated as the Corinthians were doing, but it is holy as Christ our Lord is holy. And thus, the Lord's Supper, the elements in the Lord's Supper, the body and blood of Christ are to be treated reverently. And they are for eating and drinking by Christians, not for other uses that we might think of or invent. Now, we certainly praise the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, present for us in his holy sacrament, The chief act of adoration is the one that Christ himself gave, eating it, remembering him in faith, and so receiving the forgiveness of our sins. Now, St. Paul drives the point that the Lord's Supper is not no harm, no foul, home even further. He writes this, hear it again. Whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Anyone who eats and drinks without discerning that body eats and drinks judgment on himself. And I think it's worth hearing again the next sentence, too, that doesn't get quoted as much. This is why some of you are weak and ill, and some have even died. No, they didn't catch COVID from the chalice which is theoretically possible, but highly unlikely. Rather, God's judgment broke out dramatically, visibly, against the Corinthians who had sinned and profaned the body and blood of Christ in the Lord's Supper. Now, I've never seen that happen. I've never seen someone drop dead at the communion rail. I pray I never do. But clearly, St. Paul is urgent here to say that the harm we should be afraid of comes from eating and drinking unworthily in the Lord's Supper. This is what leads him to say, let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Notice, Paul doesn't want to scare people away from it. He wishes to press them on to eat and to drink rightly. I want the very same thing for you, dear Christians. So then, what needs to be examined in us? Well, I will dare today to confess, uh, to condense them down into four key questions for the sake of time only. I urge you at another time to take up the Christian questions and their answers from the small catechism as one of the best ways I know to prepare for Holy Communion. So first question. Do I discern the body and blood of Christ in this supper? Do I believe what Jesus says so plainly in his words? This is my body. This is my blood. We know this and we answer this question by his word alone. How that can be, that is beyond our understanding, except because his word says so. That's why. That's how. And that is not a cop-out. That is the best answer for a Christian. The Lord who called this world out of nothing surely knows how to do what he says also in his holy sacrament. What do I eat and drink in this supper then? I eat and I drink Christ's true body and blood, not simply bread and wine. And if that were not what was being given to me in the Lord's Supper then how possibly could those who eat it unworthily be said to be profaning, sinning against it by eating and drinking it? Second, do I recognize and admit my sin? Am I repentant, a penitent? Jesus said that this is for the forgiveness of your sins. Well, if I have no sins, which hardly seems possible... And that would mean that this sacrament is not for me. The same is true if I am deluded to think that I don't have that many or anything important or serious to confess. Paul says that if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. Now, an arrogant person is the kind of person who says, God is my judge, he'll judge me. 
Huh. Oh, yes, he will. But his word has been given to us now to deliver his judgments clearly to us so that we may be saved and not condemned and not be held in suspense until the last day. So then I must learn from his word how my sins have certainly earned me hell. And yet hear and trust in the promise of Christ that just as certainly he has answered for those sins and declared me forgiven. And just as in confession that we talked about, I believe, help my unbelief, that is always an appropriate response. We come to the supper as repentant sinners seeking forgiveness from Christ. Fourth, then, must be do I know why I come and for what benefit? Do I believe it? Luther's explanation is real gold here. It's the simplest definition of justification by faith that I think I could imagine. And it happens here at the Lord's Supper, another sign that the sacraments, the Lord's Supper, is a gospel gift of God justifying us, delivering this cross's work to us. He writes, whoever believes these words in the testament of Christ has exactly what they say, the forgiveness of sins. You see, God's promises deliver the things that they promise. He is truly worthy to come to the Lord's Supper who has faith in those words then. But those who do not believe, they should never be compelled or urged to come to the supper. In fact, they need to not come until they do believe. Because you cannot call God a liar in his promises and pretend that you are in communion with him. And the same is true with our neighbors at this table. This is the Holy Communion, as we call it. It is not a holy group of individuals communing with God. God's truth can't be so important that it doesn't matter if we have it down truly or falsely. Christians confess his truth and we do it together, openly and honestly before each other and the world. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, Paul writes, so we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So also in the chapter before, 1 Corinthians 10, Paul teaches that just like in the Old Testament when the saints were eating the sacrifices of the temple altar, so also in Paul's day when pagans ate from their idolatrous altars too, Christians now are also participants in our altar in the Lord's Supper. And we are united with each other in approving of the teaching that happens at that altar, and that pulpit, and the pastor who serves there. Receiving communion, then, is itself a confession and a statement of your faith, dear Christians. It is your chance, so to speak, to tell the world and everyone else that you believe in what you believe. It is an action that speaks maybe even louder than words. Whenever you commune, you say, I am convinced that this church, this preacher, these Christians teach and believe truthfully. That is why I'm communing here. The fourth, or the final question, then, is this question. Am I able to be united in a true, honest confession at this altar, at this church, being under the care of this preacher, or not? Paul writes at the beginning of our text today, and throughout 1 Corinthians, though I wish there were no divisions among you in the church, I believe that that is the case, at least in part. And actually, there must, did you hear that? There must be such divisions, not happily, but in order that those who are genuine may be recognized. The last thing we could do is say God's word is not even worth arguing about. This is the only thing, perhaps, worth caring about so deeply. 
Just as we could not go to the supper and call God a liar, not believing what he says in his testament, so also we cannot go to the altar with others who sadly do not agree about what God's word means. Because that would be lying to each other and to ourselves. And to do it no less than at God's altar using his body and blood as a cover for our lie. And that is profaning, sinning against God's holy gift. For this reason, pastors teach. We take care before admitting Christians to the Lord's Supper. We want everyone to come and to receive this gift, but not by a half measure, not by our being lazy about it. We want Christians to do this rightly. We want them to recognize Christ's bodily presence. We want them to seek the forgiveness of sins that he won in repentance and in faith, and we want them to do it in a unity, in the unity of a true confession, not dishonestly, or unknowingly. It would be a pastoral failure to knowingly urge someone to come and harm themselves at the supper, whether that's by coming without repentance or without faith, without discernment, or in a duplicitous and false confession, even if it is one that is done and made out of ignorance. And perhaps especially Because it is our duty to be teachers in the church. If there is ignorance, it's because we need to do more of that teaching. Thus, we teach and we preach, as God has called us to do. And our churches take as much time as is needed so that Christians may come to the Lord's Supper honestly, knowingly, repentantly, in a word, faithfully to receive his gifts. Who is worthy to receive such a marvelous gift as this? Only those who know that they are truly quite unworthy for it, and yet who trust God's mercy in Christ Jesus. That's not just the heart of the Lord's Supper. That is the heart of Christianity itself. God, lead you and preserve you in its steadfast, in this faith, in this truth, until you die and are raised at the last day through Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you for joining us for Chapel. Today we pray for the Reverend Gary and Stephanie Schulte, who serve the Lord in the Congo. The broadcast of Chapel is underwritten by LCMS International Mission and Ministry to the Armed Forces. To learn more about LCMS International Mission and Ministry to the Armed Forces, visit kfuo.org chapel.